Good morning. It is good to be here this morning. Good to be back in Leoma after a week in Sevierville. Good to see you. So excited this morning. We don't get to have visitors with us much. So this morning we have visitors, and I got to sit through the song service with two very familiar voices right behind me, my parents, who most of you know, and they have their travel companions, Buddy and Josie Smith, with them, who have been friends of the family for back before I was even thought of. And, uh, and then we have with us Taylor Wilson, uh, who spent the night with us last night, and she was in a wedding yesterday, and she's a graduate student at Harding in Searcy, and so she's headed back to Searcy this afternoon and was in a wedding in Fayetteville yesterday. And so, uh, and Lord willing, next month we'll be with her family down in South Mississippi for a gospel meeting for the week, and she'll be in Searcy, so we're getting to see her uh, this weekend, and we're glad she was able to, to be with us. What is the most deadliest weapon in your home? Or you might go to the office area of your home, and you might think about a number two lead pencil. You know, when I was in school, that was a pretty dangerous weapon. Oh, my parents are here, aren't they? Let me, let me change that. My brother used a pencil very well when he was in school as a deadly weapon. Or you might think about the scissors that might be there. You know, that could be a very, very deadly weapon if they're used properly. Maybe it's, your, maybe it's your nightstand, and on that nightstand there's a pocket knife there. It's a, it's a very deadly weapon. It can be if used the right way. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a bow and arrow. You know, that time's coming, and we get that thing out and start putting those arrows in there and start slinging those arrows, and we know that they are, in fact, very, very deadly. Maybe it's in the gun safe or behind the closet door there. It's a, it's a shotgun. It's a rifle. It's a pistol. It's some type of firearm in your home. I want you to realize this morning that none of those are the most deadliest weapons in your home. The most deadliest weapon you possess, we all have one. Kids get them when they're born. They're most dangerous when they're idle. Yet when you put them in action, they can get you in serious trouble. If not used properly, they hurt very deeply. To the point that it would almost be better to be dead than not to be. It's your tongue. It's that little thing in your mouth that is in every home. And it is the most deadliest weapon you possess. We've been talking about the home. And this morning we want to think about the T's of the home as we spell the word tongue. You realize that language has power because it has intention. Words have power because they have meaning behind them. And so we began this morning by asking ourselves, where does the meaning come from? Where does the power come from? As you open your Bible to the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew, and what, what Ryan read a moment ago from Matthew 12 Beginning in verse 33, Jesus gave perhaps one of the most stern name-calling examples in all of the Scriptures. When He said in verse 34 of Matthew 12, you brood of vipers. And then what He says next, having their attention... Do you not realize that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks? Language is powerful. Words have meaning because they come 
from the heart. They come from inside of us. Remember two weeks ago we talked about it's not what goes into a man, but what comes out of a man that defiles him. We, we have processes within us that can properly process even harmful things that go into our body and expose of them in ways that God has created us to do so. But when you let something come out, you turn over in your Bible to Matthew 22 and you go down to about the 15th verse of Matthew 22, the Bible says that the Pharisees were seeking opportunity to trap Jesus, how? With His words. Language has power. Words have meaning. And the Pharisees knew this. And so they thought, if, if we can get Jesus to, to slip up, mess up, trip up with His words... And we can trap Jesus. We've been trying to get Him to do something wrong for a long time. And we, we've come to the conclusion that He's not going to do anything wrong. So let's try to, Matthew 22 and verse 15, let's try to trap Him in His words. Let's try to twist His tongue up or get Him tongue tied or, 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 or do something to cause Him to say something He shouldn't say. And the 22nd chapter of Matthew is followed by the 23rd chapter of Matthew. And what does Jesus do in the 23rd chapter of Matthew? He says, Woe to you, Pharisees. You want to trap Jesus in His words? Good luck. He gives some of the most stern warnings in the very next chapter. Seven of them, if you count them correctly. And he starts by saying, Woe to you, about verse 3, scribes and Pharisees who sit on the seat of Moses, yet you do not practice what you preach. You want to trap Jesus in His words? You better be careful. You might awaken a, you might awaken a stern teaching. Because boy, they sure did. He didn't stop there, no. He went on and he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And, and you get down to about the 25th verse of Matthew 23, and he's talking about them as being hypocrites, and he's talking about them as being clean on the outside but dirty on the inside, and he's talking about them being like a, a tomb that just looks beautiful. The, the, the vault, just a beautiful vault. But you know what we put inside of vaults, don't you? We put dead bodies. We put corpse. We put bones. We put a shell of, a, of an individual. We don't put soul and spirit. We just put a body there. But we spend thousands of dollars. It looks beautiful. And I've put dirt on some fancy stuff. And Jesus says in Matthew 23, that's what you Pharisees are. You're like a beautiful vault on the outside, but inwardly you're a bunch of rottening bones. Doesn't get much more graphic than that, does it? It's pretty easy to understand, isn't it? You want to try Jesus in His words? Good luck! But they tried it. It backfired, I would suggest. We come over to the 26th chapter of the book of Matthew and Jesus is on trial now. And he's being arrested and He's going on trial. And you get down toward the end of that chapter. It's a very long chapter. You get down to about verse 63 of that chapter. And what does the Bible say in Matthew 26 and verse 63? The Bible says Jesus remained silent. He's standing before the high priest. He's there before Caiaphas in that paragraph of Matthew 26. And Caiaphas, the high priest, is saying, Are you who you say you are? Tell us, are you the Son of God? I've never been challenged before when I didn't want to answer. Have you? Tell us, are you who you say you are? And the Bible says in Matthew 26 and verse 63 that Jesus remained silent. Some of the best things you can say in life is to say nothing at all. Now he's going to talk in, in a couple of verses down, 
But at this moment, he said nothing. As you think about the heart behind our words, I, I wanted to go there to, to, to remind you in a way of introduction to, to the tease of the tongue to say it's imperative that we get our hearts right. Because according to Matthew 12 and verse 34, it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. And there are Pharisees in our world today that are trying to trip us, trap us, cause us to stumble over our own words. And they need stern woes like Jesus gave those Pharisees. And I think you and I have perfect authority and permission to do it under the umbrella of Christ to warn those who are living hypocrisy and who are looking good on the outside and who are preaching one thing and practicing another. But then there are also times when we need to be silent. As we think about the T's of the tongue, can I, can I start with two warnings? It's just, it's just warnings from my heart that I, I think you need to hear. The first one is, Technology. It's everything from social media to emails to text messaging. Folks, I, I love technology. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not real familiar with social media outside of Facebook. I know there's some other things out there. And I know that a lot of you are using them. Here's what I want to say by way of warning you will be held accountable for what you say on them. Please hear me. Just because you're on a phone, just because you're on a computer, just because it's not audibly coming out of your mouth, you will be held accountable for what you do and what you say and the actions that you occur on technology or technological devices. And so I just, I just want to warn you. Folks, when you get on there, and I've seen you do it, and like things that are not biblical, you're going to be given account for that. When you congratulate people for things that are... I'll just give you one example particular individual gets on there and they are celebrating the pregnancy that they have with a child and they are not married. And then you scroll down. You've, you've been there, right? You scroll down and you see a brother or sister in Christ. Congratulations! You will give an account for that. Or I could keep you all the way to the 6 o'clock service if you wanted every example. I just need to give you a warning. Those abbreviations that you use, I, I don't care if you don't spell out God. When you type OMG, that is oh my God, that is using God's name in vain, and I don't care if it's an abbreviation or not. you got to be careful. The T's of the tongue... Ty Rhymes said over there in that youth rally a couple of Saturdays ago that Facebook has not made the lame to walk, but it has caused the mute to speak. And we've got people speaking that don't need to be speaking. And they're doing so through technological avenues. That is one warning. Let me give you another warning. Oh, there, there, there are many, many warnings about technology. Let me just give you one more and then let me move on to my second warning or second area of warning. You and I, I'm there, you hear me? You and I will do things on technology that we would not do in the public world. But then number two, we will say things on technology that we would not say face to face. Now let me warn you that if I've got a fault with you, I don't pick up my phone and text you. Now you can advocate all day long that well, when the Scripture was written, God did not know that there would be cell phones. That's a lie. 
And you could advocate that, well, when God wrote the Scriptures in Matthew 18, and He said, when you've got a fight with a brother, you go to them face to face. God did not know we would have email on computers. That's a lie. God knew it all. Did we have those things when He wrote the Scriptures through the Holy Spirit? No. That is not an excuse for you to not... God, we didn't even have telephones. The point is, in Matthew 18, when you're resolving conflict between a brother and a sister, you go to them face to face because God knew that would be the best way to handle that conflict, the most successful way, and the most God-honoring way. And we didn't have a telephone, we didn't have an email, we didn't have a telegraph, we didn't have a text message or nothing. God intended it to be that way. He intended us for, for us to work things out face to face. Don't use technology as a caveat, as an excuse, as a way of laziness. That's a warning. Pick up the phone at least. Call. Talk. But if you can, go face to face. Meet. Visit. Share with each other. That's what God desires. My second warning is in the area not of technology, but in the area of tolerating. We're talking about the tease of the tongue. And here's what I've seen in my own lifetime. We are tolerating much, much more. I watched just last evening, and since he's a former Mississippi State coach, I can talk about him all day. I watched just last evening in a post-game interview, I heard the man say a cuss word. Just last night. I remember a day when all of that was bleeped. And then I remember the day when we started bleeping the bad ones. Right? You know what I'm talking about. And now we don't bleep anything. I remember the day as a boy growing up as a huge NASCAR fan when a NASCAR driver got out of his car, said a cuss word in a post-race interview, and they fined him for it. He said it on national television and he had to pay $10,000 for saying a cuss word. Wow. See, we're just, we're just tolerating it, aren't we? It's, it's just becoming more and, and more and... And, and cussing's just one example. We're tolerating perverted talk. We're tolerating, we're to tolerating sexual immorality type talk. I mean, I, the list is long. I'm just trying to warn you. I thought I'd get on my computer and I'd just type up. I would just Google the word desensitized because that's what we've become, right? Desensitize. In other words, we hear those words and we just don't even think about them anymore because we're being bombarded with them from the movies and the television and shows. And, and I'm telling you now, I'm a sports fan, but I'll, I'll be balanced with you here. You want to watch your R-rated movies? I want to watch my football games. I'm telling you, we're tolerating some immorality. We've got to be careful. It's affecting us. It's affecting us so much. So let me, can I share my new word with you? I got a new word. I don't even know if I can pronounce it right. It's called cognitive dialectology. You Google it. I'm telling you, I wouldn't lie. I'm telling you, it's a real thing. And what it is, is it is the study of the change of our cognitive behavior to language. Hey, don't tell me Google's bad. I learn stuff from Google all the time. Cognitive dialectology. Wow. There's even a whole study in the realm of science on the way we behave to certain words and how words are harmful within a particular culture and a society. You and I are not feeling the hurt as much anymore we began to tolerate. And so it's okay as long as it's the punchline of a joke. Or it's okay as long as it... I'm not throwing you under the bus. I'm under the bus with you, okay? It's okay as long as it's, 
under the umbrella of stress management. Or it's okay as long as it's technology related and it's not actually coming out of my mouth. Or it's okay as long as it's in moderation. In other words, everything needs to be in moderation. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? So as long as I just... It's okay as, as long as I don't do it around my parents. It's okay to do it around my friends. When I was in middle school, and yes, I know my parents are here. When I was in middle school, here's what we did. We turned the words around and set them backwards. And we thought we were real cute at it. Because we could say the word backwards and the teacher wouldn't know what we were saying and so we wouldn't get in trouble. But it had the same meaning, didn't it? Words have meanings, don't they? Language has power, doesn't it? I don't care if you turn it around. I don't care if you abbreviate it. I don't care if you mispronounce it. When it comes out of the heart... You're accountable for it. And that's where it comes from. And so I warn you in the area of technology and in the area of tolerating. Then I want to give you a couple more T's as we think about the T of the tongue. The first one is truth. Truth. You know, we could talk about tattling. We could talk about lying. We could talk about a lot of of, of areas of, of, of truth. What is truth? What is the value of truth? Proverbs 23 and verse 23, the Bible says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Jesus says in John 8 and verse 32, you can know the truth and it will set you free. Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4 and verse 25 and he says, Put away all falsehood and let every man speak the truth with his neighbor. Put away all falsehood. He says in Ephesians 4 and verse 15, to speak the truth in love. That it might grow and that it might cause the body to be built up and brought to a mature stature and standing. The truth. By the truth. Let what comes out of your tongue be the truth. You, you don't have to apologize for the truth. You don't have to support the truth. You, you don't have to prop it up and, and put columns in under it so that it will hold and stand. It will stand on its own. You just tell the truth. You don't have to lie to cover the truth. You have to lie to cover a lie to cover a lie to cover a lie. You don't have to do that with the truth. If it's the truth, it's the truth. The wise man says, buy it. And whatever you do, don't sell it. Jesus says, know it and you can be free. Paul says to the Ephesians, get it in your mouth and put everything else out of your mouth and do it in love. Not just the truth, but the truth with the right attitude and the right spirit. From where? Where all words come from. I tell my wife all the time, well, hon, I didn't mean it like that. I got to quit lying. I got to quit lying because if you said it, you meant it, right? Come from your heart. That's where the mouth speaks from, the abundance of the heart. Well, I didn't mean it that way. Well, you said it that way. Kind of makes me convinced you meant it that way. The truth. What we say and how we say it and knowing what the truth is and speaking the truth with the right attitude and love in concern, in the desire to... Look at Ephesians 4 and verse 15 in its context. In the desire to build up and encourage one another. But then let me give you one more. T's for the tongue. The importance of taming. 
the tongue. As we close this morning, I want you to be reminded of what we've studied from, if you open your Bible to James 3 and verse 8, the Bible says in James 3 and verse 8 that no man can control the tongue. And we read that verse and it gives us the excuse to say whatever we want to say. No, it does not. Because let me go with you back up the page there in James 3 and verse 2. Do you see it? If any man bridles his tongue, he has become perfect to the point of being able to bridle his whole body. Verse 8 is not an excuse to say anything you want to say. Verse 8 is a warning. Let me tell you something. If you want to try to tame this little dude, you've got a big mountain to climb on your hands. As a matter of fact, you can't do it by yourself. That's what verse 8 says. If you're going to tame your tongue, you've got to have help in order to do it. But it can be done. Because if it couldn't be done, then verse 2 is a contradiction. It can be bridled. It can be muzzled. We can learn when to be silent, when to speak, what to say when we speak. How do we do that? How do we tame the tongue? Well, drop down in your Bible now and begin in verse 13 of James chapter 3. And what's he talking about in verse 13? He's not talking about the tongue. He's talking about wisdom. And he says of being wise and understanding. He says in verse, six, verse 15 rather that there is wisdom that is earthly and unspiritual and demonic. And when that wisdom exists, listen to verse 16, there is selfishness and there is jealousy that is there and there is disorder that is there and there is every vile practice that you could think of that's there. But then he says in verse 17, but wisdom that is from above is first pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's open to reason. It's full of mercy. It's full of good fruits. It's impartial and it's sincere. There's a whole, there's a whole series of lessons that could be done on James 3 and verse 17. Let me just say this morning, if you want to control your tongue, you've got to get wisdom from above. It's the only way to do it. You can't do it by yourself. Because if you try to do it by yourself, it's going to be worldly and it's going to be earthly and it's going to be all of those things described in verse 15 and 16. Let me give you a challenge. Before you open your mouth, ask yourself, is it pure? Is it peaceable? Is it gentle? Is it open to reason? Is it full of mercy? Is it full of good fruits? Is it impartial? Is it sincere? And by the time you get through analyzing it, you might just decide you don't need to say it. And some of you would be better off for it, and so would I. Because I remind you, you cannot regret something you didn't say. And so ask yourself, is what I'm about to say, does it fit that category and if it don't, remember Matthew 26 and verse 63. Jesus remained silent, taming the tongue. We can, with God's help, tame the tongue. Have a tongue that is filled with the truth, that is, that is under control. If we understand what the truth is, if we understand what God wants from us, if we understand the desire that God has for us to be in control, if we accept the warnings of the potential dangers that are out there and don't get ourselves caught up in those traps, realizing that it all starts in the heart. What is the most deadliest weapon in your home? Are you using it to the glory of God? As His child, 
faithful in the blood of Christ? Or are you faulting in that and being unfaithful to the Lord? Needing help to tame it, to control it. Having the warnings and wanting the truth. The Lord's invitation is open to you and we invite you to come as we stand and sing.